All right, well, we've got to talk about this. And when the Lord started showing me that Jerusalem, her people, her ancient monarchy, and the restored monarchy, our mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the one who played the scarlet harlot against God in God's own words in the Bible, I had no idea that this development was coming. I see even more clearly in what's just taking place in Israel the meaning of the word anti-Christ. Um, you know, they're trying to remove him and they are in opposition to him. And when the Lord first showed me that they were mystery, Babylon the Great, I said to myself, no way. And several years have gone by since I was writing down everything from the scripture, proving it. And then I started sharing it with you because I couldn't finish working on the second book due to the circumstances of my mother's death and the sale of our home, etc. And having everything dismantled from our home. So I started telling these things on my videos. So this development that's happening is just unbelievable to me, which proves it without a doubt. And I wrote down telling somebody the thing that's scary is that when they put that king on the restored Davidic throne, that's an earthly king, he's going to be an authoritarian, a dictator, and he's going to implement every bill that he wants passed. If the king embraces these ideas of these ultra-Orthodox rabbis, then the people living in the state of Israel are in big trouble, also known as Jacob's trouble. It just blows me away. Those were my words today to a friend who uh, was sharing the article with me that came out that everybody's been speaking about. I don't know about everybody, but this is a development continuing on with the last topic I talked about regarding what the ultra-Orthodox Shaz party was trying to pass the other bill discriminating against the women at the Western Wall who are praying there, trying to take away the equal rights that they have to pray at the Wall by preventing them and criminalizing them having a Torah scroll or reading the Word of God there at the prayer wall or wearing a prayer shawl or phylacteries or making music unto the Lord, any kind of praise to God, and they want to suppress and oppose God's Word, although they claim to have God's Word. So let's look at the true definition of the meaning anti-Christ. In some Christian teachings, a personal opponent of the Messiah, of Christ, expected to appear before the end of the world. Well, I have the chills because the appearance of anti-Christ is now starting to present itself in a full-fledged anti-Christ mode in Jerusalem, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, thus proving that what the Lord had shown me was absolutely 100% accurate. And anti-Christ is a person or force seen as opposing Christ or the Christian church. A person or thing regarded as supremely evil or as a fundamental enemy or opponent of Jesus the Messiah and his church. So Antichrist means one who is opposing Christ, Jesus Christ, in conflict or competition with a specified or implied subject, differing from or in conflict with each other, facing the opposite to oppose is to disapprove of. So the Antichrist is disapproving of in an attempt to prevent, especially by argument. 
So what are they trying to do but prevent the gospel from being preached? They, they are so evil, they want you to not be able to talk to your best friend next to you about Jesus. Oppose means actively resist or refuse to comply with a person or system. So this is the system of Antichrist, and if we are seeing these things forming right before our eyes, we are at the threshold of the rapture of the believers in Jesus Christ, the true Savior of the world. To oppose also means to compete against someone in a contest. A candidate to oppose the leader in the presidential contest. So they're basically opposing the true king of righteousness and implementing their king as lifting themselves up as righteousness thinking that they are being a so-called light unto the nations which they absolutely are not being but are in opposition to that light antichrist is one who denies or opposes the messiah or christ specifically a great antagonist expected to fill the world with wickedness but to be conquered forever by christ at his second coming. Antichrist is used in an exaggerated way to describe a person regarded as a powerful and uh, male malevolent adversary. Those who want to suppress the gospel message of Jesus Christ and they're squashing it and trying to manipulate and maneuver it away from the goodness away from the people. By that I mean the goodness of God and his eternal salvation. Antichrist refers to people prophesied by the Bible to oppose Jesus Christ and substitute themselves in Christ's place before the second coming. The term Antichrist including one plural form is found four times in the New Testament solely in the first and second epistle of John. The Antichrist is announced as the one who denies the Father and the Son. Now there's some actual paintings which shows the Antichrist which was the figure on the left of this painting with attributes of a king. So there you go. I'm telling you there's no doubt in my mind the Holy Spirit was revealing that they're putting that king on the throne. And when they do put that king on the throne, he's going to have all power and authority under his coronation to implement his ideas, to pass bills that he believes in. And this is going to come to pass. And I believe that this bill against the women at the Western Wall, and now the same group of people of ultra-orthodox rabbis are trying to implement criminalizing the gospel. So this is the same group I talked about before, but now they're p trying to pass this other bill. When they set that king upon the throne and he adopts these ideas and theories and puts them into place, the people of Israel will have no say, they will have no vote, and this will be Jacob's trouble because it's going to be causing trouble for the people. The leaders are going to be the wolves that come in and prevent the people from having the gospel salvation message of their own Messiah, their own King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's very evil and wicked and you can see the writing on the wall. Now one of the things I said before about the two witnesses Elijah and Moses, they have a testimony already. And this is why I named my channel Elijah and Moses, because the Lord showed me in detail that testimony of theirs. And I shared it in the book, and I decided to name my channel that, because the Lord showed me this whole uh, story involving them in great detail. And I realized, wow, you know, this is an end time message. So I began to share that. And you realize 
that they are the two witnesses of Jesus death burial and resurrection they were on the mountain and he was transfigured before them and Moses and Elijah appeared in the glory cloud with God's glory and they were standing in his divine presence as the cloud overshadowed the three disciples that were set apart as Kadesh and they saw him in his glory they were they fell asleep and they were awakened and they saw his glory this is like the resurrection of the dead so they were witnesses they are coming to give an end time testimony of Jesus Christ and his gospel message why do you think that the two witnesses are killed in Jerusalem because they are not going to be allowing the gospel of Jesus Christ in God's own holy city where he said his name will be written forever and these people are trying to eliminate the gospel message right there in God's holy city so the two witnesses come and they're giving the gospel message they're given a last chance to repent and turn to God but they will not do it because they're stubborn and they're steeped in their own selfish righteousness of themselves they're trying to replace the king with another king that's just a worldly man that has no power and authority from God he's going to be anointed during a coronation ceremony with some holy oil that's missing some of its parts um, I cannot believe the development of this since the Lord had revealed that whole thing to me and I'm I'm just I, I'm saying it because I'm shocked so this is why the two witnesses are going to be killed in the streets of Jerusalem known also as Sodom and Egypt where their Lord was crucified they're giving the gospel message that those rabbis, the ultra-Orthodox, do not want that gospel message. So they're willing to kill God's two witnesses. The two trees that stand before the God of all the earth. Why are they trees? Think about this. Because this is something that happened to me long, long ago. I went to college in a certain town. I participated in all kinds of musical concerts and events. I was a percussionist, I was a singer, all of this stuff I participated in. A lot of people knew me. They knew me from where I worked. You know, so tons of people knew me. And I could easily go visit any of these people. But there came a time, what, maybe 15, 20 years later, where all those people moved away. None of the people that knew me were still in the town. Some of them died, some of them moved away, some of them had jobs in other states, and they were gone. So when I went up to the bike trail, and I was riding my bike, I realized it hit me. The only thing left that saw my presence here were the trees. The only thing that were a witness in this city that I was here were the trees. And so I wrote the poem in my book about the trees because of the gospel because they were eyewitnesses of his testimony and their history with the Lord and about the Lord is recorded in the rings of wood they are the two trees and this is what I realized from my own poem that the Lord had me write in 2007 when I was it, this whole poem came to me about the trees and now I'm realizing why they are the two trees that gospel message is a witness is a testimony that can never be erased and it's permanent and now realizing why the two witnesses are the trees that stand before God I'd like to read my poem that's from my book I put in my book that God had me write in 2007 when I realized that the only thing in the city that remembered anything that I ever did or that I was ever there were the trees that recorded it in their rings. 
And my poem is called In the Arms of a Tree, a poem by Kimberly K. Ballard. I found serenity in the arms of a tree. In its shelter and shade, I came searching for me. Lost here, alone, returning to find an old friend to recognize or hug me, to give me peace of mind. In its might, it stood strong, unchanged and unmoved. It had shared all my days, only it understood. Every moment contained in its rings of wood. It was then that I realized God was just like the tree. He was there with his angels to set my heart free. I found serenity in the arms of a tree. It was God himself comforting me. Actually, I have that I wrote that November 27th, copyright 2000, seven years before my almond tree revelation. And ironically, it happens to be on page 77 of my book. This is my mom's copy, so it's got book markers in it. But it's the almond tree, Aaron's rod, the Messiah, King of Israel. If you want the true testimony of the King of Israel, the Messiah, this is the book to read. I'm not saying don't read the Bible. I'm saying that God gives revelations for the last days and pours out His Spirit on people. And that's what He did in this testimony. You think that's a coincidence? That that came seven years before my almond tree miracle that happened in Jerusalem on Holy Mount Moriah? And God gave me the message at 4 a.m. when he woke me up and this light bulb turned on and I got this message from the Lord. He said, send it to Jerusalem in my spirit and I sent it. And a miracle came back from there, from Holy Mount Moriah, from the place where Jesus Christ was resurrected from death to life. Do you think that's interesting that there's this painting of the Antichrist that has the attributes of a king? after me telling you that I saw in Revelation 13 the revived monarchy of Israel of Judah coming to pass in Revelation 13 and they were the ones their monarchy was the one that had the deadly head wound that was healed because the monarchy is going to be healed and restored and they're gonna make this earthly king their king is he going to be the Antichrist it's looking more and more like it. And remember, Daniel said that a beast is a king. False Christ is also found in the Gospels in Matthew chapter 24 and Mark chapter 13. Jesus alerts his disciples not to be deceived by the false prophets who will claim themselves as being Messiah, performing great signs and wonders. Now remember I told you Rabbi Chaim Richman used to be the director of the Temple Institute had once made that comment that when they get the third temple built they will be able to make fire come down from the sky and consume the offering. So now you know you're getting the picture of where Antichrist is going to sit in Jerusalem try to proclaim that he is God to replace and oppose the true king. Okay. Jerusalem is mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And Jerusalem is the mother of us all since Adam and Eve were created in that location on Holy Mount Moriah. Three other images often associated with the singular Antichrist are the little horn in Daniel's final vision, the man of sin in Paul the Apostle's second epistle to the Thessalonians, and the beast of the sea in the book of Revelation. Now there's something else the Lord showed me quite some time ago when the Turk Adnan Oktar was talking to the Sanhedrin rabbis and they were all invoking the crescent moon god together um, and they were talking about how this Turk would help them to build the temple and of course now he's in prison so that can't happen. But these Sanhedrin rabbis that want to be the world's supreme court and want to elevate themselves to that place 
And if they want to be the world supreme court, then obviously they want to be the world government with the king at the top as the main ruler of the world. And they're going to want the people to bow and scrape to the um, agenda of the ultra-Orthodox rabbis. But when I was watching that Turk, something hit me when I was watching that because he he said, can we bring out a picture and show the shofar, okay? And a lot of times they show the little tiny shofars, you know, of the ram's horns or they have the big curly ones. There's all different sizes, but you know, most people really like the long, you know, 36 inch or 42 inch ones. So instead of bringing out a picture of the ram's horn, he brought out the picture of a little horn. <laughs> That's what hit me about it. That's a little horn. Well, guess what kind of horn? And this was all my thinking as I was looking at the picture. It's an English hunting horn, he showed. And guess where the king is coming from? England. And one of the things that I think is interesting about uh, the British Museum says about this type of horn that it was engraved with figures of a king or a bishop. Now let me just show you there's several different types of horns but the old type that was like in the medieval times was made out of a cow's horn which is interesting because the Jews don't use the cow's horn. They don't use a horn from a cow simply because of the golden calf incident. So the shofars have to not be made out of a cow horn of any kind. It has to be made out of the ram's horn, you know, a gazelle or, you know, certain types of kosher animals like that, but never a cow horn. But now they have brass horns that are short. They're a little horn, and they use this when they're fox hunting. So let me show you. So needless to say, when it was speaking about the little horn and the Antichrist, and I saw him bring out not a shofar, not a Jewish ram's horn, but he brought out the English hunting horn, which is a little horn, I was putting two and two together in my mind. He wasn't saying these words. He was showing a different type of horn. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's an English hunting horn. Does that mean that this is the Antichrist that's going to basically be hunting God's people <laughs> in the future? I mean, really, it made me wonder. And now with all these developments, I wanted to share that with you, that that was one of the things I saw that alarmed me. So now add all of that to everything that I've shown about the mark of the beast being the king's royal cipher with his name, his number, his title, his crown on it. It's going to be the mark of subservience to the people who are underneath him. The people will have no say. He will force his mark to be upon the people so that they will comply with the king. And what does this mean? But he will be implementing this ideology. So now let's get to the basics of everything I'm showing you with what is happening now and how this is developing with this sudden ultra-Orthodox bill that they want to pass. I had a couple of articles about it, and then my friend Susan sent me a third article. And this was the article from AllIsrael.com exclusive. Two Knesset members proposed legislation to outlaw sharing the gospel in Israel and send violators to prison. Could it become law? 
It will when they put that king in place. I guarantee it. Former Trump Pence official warns Bill poses massive threat to free speech, human rights, and religious freedom. It pictures the two Knesset members behind this. It's the United Torah Judaism Knesset members, Moshe Gaffney to the left, and Yaakov Asher, seen in the plenum hall of the Israeli parliament. This picture was from February 11th, 2013. Photo Miriam Alster, Flash 90. Okay, so they're going to kill the two witnesses that are preaching the gospel. And here's why. Jerusalem, Israel. Is it possible that the Israeli government this year, why this year? Because there's going to be a king appointed and anointed and given power and authority at some point. Okay, so is it possible that the Israeli government this year could pass legislation making it illegal for people to share the gospel message in the very land where Jesus was born, raised, preached, and I want to say performed miracles and healed people, the Israeli people, and where he preached and died and was buried and rose from the dead, and I want to say that he bore our sins on the cross? Unfortunately, yes. At Palm Sunday and Easter approach, the most sacred days on the calendar for those who follow Jesus, it's really Feast of First Fruits, people. It's not Easter, that's Ishtar. So Passover is when he died, he was in the grave, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and he rose on the Feast of First Fruits. The two most sacred days on the calendar for those who follow Jesus as both God and Messiah. Two members of the Knesset, Israel's parliament, introduced a bill last week that would ban any and all efforts to tell people about Jesus, Yeshua. The bill would send violators to prison. Should it begin to gain traction inside the Knesset and begin moving towards passage, the bill could create a major new headache for Netanyahu's government by sparking a serious clash with evangelical Christians in the United States and around the world who are among the biggest supporters of the state of Israel. And that's the ironic thing. You know, these rabbis, they love to take the money of Christians. They love to take the tourist money. You know, what's going to happen if they pass this law and you can't even speak to your best friend about Jesus or you'll be imprisoned? And what's going to happen to all of the walking in Jesus' footsteps in Israel and visiting all the sites where he performed his miracles? You think they're going to ban the tourists from coming there next after they pass this law? Should it begin to gain traction inside the Knesset and begin moving towards passage, the bill could create a major new headache for Netanyahu's government. And also remember, there's a lot of Messianic Jews who believe that Jesus is the Messiah and their king. In the United States alone, there are some 60 million evangelicals. Globally, there are an estimated 600 million, according to the World Evangelical Alliance. The bill could also draw sharp criticism from both Republicans and Democrats in Congress in the executive branch among U.S. governors and others who love Israel and have always stood with the Jewish state but would fiercely oppose efforts to silence followers of Jesus in the Holy Land. So who is opposing Jesus? This is the Antichrist rising. Right there in Jerusalem, the very place I said was Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the scarlet harlot against God. Former U.S. Ambassador of International Religious Freedom, Sam Brownback, who served during the Trump-Pence 
administration is the first American leader to publicly warn that this new bill poses a massive threat to free speech, human rights, and religious freedom, as well as the bill they tried to pass against the Jewish women at the Western Wall to be able to read the Word of God for themselves at the wall while praying to God and honoring Him there. On Friday, All Israel News emailed Brown back a longtime and consistent friend and supporter of Israel, a professional translation of the bill in English, which was originally written in Hebrew, of course. Surprised and concerned, the ambassador replied with the following statement, Free and democratic countries simply do not outlaw the free exchange of ideas, and that includes religious beliefs and convictions. Article 18 of the Universal Charter of Human Rights, which Israel has signed on to, guarantees freedom of religion, including the right to decide your own faith beliefs. What does the new bill actually say? The proposed legislation would outlaw all efforts by people of one faith, the Christians, who in any way want to discuss or try to persuade people of other faiths to consider changing their current religious beliefs. The punishment for doing so would be one year imprisonment. If the conversation is with a minor, someone under the age of 18, the punishment would be two years imprisonment. This bill would apply to people having spiritual conversations with Israelis of any religion. However, in their official explanation of the bill, the two Israeli legislators specifically emphasized the warning to stop Christians in particular. Now, because they're hiding who the members of the Sanhedrin are now, they will not show you the list of names, it's more than likely these two are from the Sanhedrin, I would be willing to wager. The bill does not only make a simple personal conversation about Jesus with another individual a crime, it would also make it illegal for someone who solicits a person directly, digitally, by mail, or online that means the internet, in order to convert his religion. Thus, producing, publishing online videos explaining the gospel to Jewish or Muslim people in Israel and to those of any other religious faiths would suddenly become illegal. And I believe this is going to happen when that king sits on that throne. Publishing books other printed literature, online articles, podcasts, or other forms of media that explains the life and ministry of Jesus and his message found in the New Testament would also become illegal. Are you kidding me that they are this blind and this dumb? So would discussing the gospel message via email, text messages, written letters, and or on social media, including answering questions initiated by people who don't follow Jesus. So basically, like, you know, if my mother was here and I wanted to write her a letter about Jesus, it would be illegal to do that. You know, uh, the testimony that I have, that the Lord gave me through His Spirit, unbelievable. It is already a crime in Israel to try to proselytize minors or bribe people of any age with money or material goods to change their religious views. But this new legislation seeks to go much further. At times, these attempts do not involve monetary promises or material gains and are therefore not illegal according to the current law the bill notes, but the many negative repercussions, including psychological damages, warrant the intervention of the legislature. Therefore, it is proposed that alongside the prohibition of giving favors as an incentive to convert religion, which I don't think people are really doing that, they're giving the gospel message the good news. Uh, let's see. That would also be prohibited with and it will be called an act of solicitation to convert religion when it is done directly to a person, whether that be face-to-face -face or via any other means of communication. Who wrote this anti-Christian legislation? The authors of this legislation are Moshe Gaffney and Yaakov Asher, our ultra-Orthodox Jewish members of Knesset. Both are members of the United Torah Judaism, the UTJ, a Haredi, highly 
religious political party, holding a total of 7 out of 120 seats in the current Knesset. In my opinion, part of the seven heads and ten horns. And both are influential voices and important votes inside the 64-seat governing coalition led by Netanyahu. Gaffney is 70 years old and he was first elected to the Knesset in 1988 and has served almost continuously since then. Today he serves as the chairperson of the Knesset's powerful finance committee as well as a member of the foreign affairs and defense committee and the joint committee for the defense budget. Well, take a listen to that because if they implement these laws and in the future the king he puts his mark, his royal cipher, on the people. It's interesting that this guy is a powerful finance committee member. Asher, age 57, was first elected to Parliament in 2013. Today he serves as chairperson of the Knesset's Internal Affairs and Environmental Protection Committee. So there you bring in the King's climate change, the WEF agenda, all of that right there to Jerusalem, Mystery Babylon. Gaffney has a long history of opposing followers of Jesus. He first introduced legislation to impose a legal ban on evangelism in Israel back in 1999. His bill went nowhere, but Gaffney has repeatedly reintroduced versions of his legislation ever since. While he does not agree theologically with evangelicals about who Jesus is, Netanyahu has long viewed the evangelical community as a true blessing and a strategic asset to the state of Israel and to the Jewish people worldwide. That's because the Christians bring in lots of tourist money to the state of Israel. Are they going to throw that away when they throw away Jesus? That's my question. That's why for three decades Netanyahu has actively and consistently courted and cultivated strong support for Israel among evangelical Christians of which there are some 60 million in the United States and 600 million worldwide, as I said. Netanyahu meets regularly with Christian leaders from a wide range of denominations and often speaks at Christian conferences and forums, including at the Christian Media Summit, organized by Israel's government press office each year in Jerusalem. And, you know, some of the rabbis working to build the third temple came and spoke here. And did they get paid? Did they get paid by the people who had them speak? Yes, they did, the Christians. So they take all that money back there you know, and they raise money for the building of the third temple and it seems like there was a story that they found some gold somewhere and acquired all of that but now they're still needing money so that's really strange. He speaks at Christian conferences and forums including the Christian Media Summit organized by Israel's government press office each year in Jerusalem. Just last year I brought a delegation of uh, evangelical business and media leaders to meet with Netanyahu at the Knesset. During his book tour several months ago, Netanyahu also spoke on numerous Christian TV networks, including TBN, CBN, and two most viewed evangelical networks in the United States. Why could this year be different? Because the king is coming. I'm telling you. That's why. That said, Evangelical and Messianic Jewish leaders who have spoken to all Israel news in recent days say they are concerned that in the present political environment and the legislation introduced by Gaffney and Asher could actually become law. They note that out of the 120 seat Knesset, the current government coalition is comprised of a large number of Orthodox and ultra Orthodox members. These members are far more aggressive in this legislative session than ever before in pushing for legislations to be passed that advance their theological worldview. And these members appear to believe that Netanyahu cannot afford to lose their votes if he hopes to remain prime minister and hopes to advance his other important policy priorities including stopping the Iranian regime from building nuclear weapons, making peace with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, strengthening and expanding the Israeli economy, especially as the U.S. economy slows, and passing sweeping judicial reforms. Indeed, the current judicial reform movement 
raises further concerns for evangelical and messianic Jewish leaders. Many reforms are believed, in fact, to be needed to improve Israel's flawed legal system. However, they worry that if the Knesset passes an extreme version of an override clause, one of the most controversial and hotly debated of the proposed reforms which would allow the Knesset to override Israeli Supreme Court decisions with a simple majority vote of just 61 out of 120 members. This could severely endanger the human rights and civil liberties of all minorities in the country, including religious minorities such as followers of Jesus. It would be a different matter if the override clause required a super majority of, say, 90 seats in the Knesset to pass legislation previously struck down by the Supreme Court. Even a compromise on the override clause issue could be both positive and acceptable. Where the final legislation requires less than 90 votes, but far more than 61 to overturn a Supreme Court decision but legislation that would allow a simple majority to overrule the high court, they believe, poses a serious threat for a number of reasons. For example, if the Gaffney-Asher bill becomes law, the Supreme Court would likely strike it down as a violation of free speech, basic human rights, and freedom of religion. However, if the currently proposed version of the override clause also becomes law, then a simple majority of just 61 Knesset members would be able to cancel the High Court's decision. That would enable the current Knesset to go forward with banning all forms of evangelism in Israel and would provide no legal recourse whatsoever to Jewish and Gentile people, Israelis or foreigners who love Jesus and want to tell others about him. This is a major and disturbing new development in the country and one that all Israel News will be covering closely. So the following in Jerusalem is a professional English translation of the full text of the newly proposed legislation introduced by Knesset members Moshe Gaffney and Yaakov Asher. These are the amendments and it says someone who solicits a person directly, digitally, by mail or online in order to convert his religion, the punishment, one year imprisonment. And if the person was a minor, the punishment, two years imprisonment. Of Clause 368. Okay, then it says in subclause A, in place of six months imprisonment will come two years imprisonment. The penal law, 1977, there and after the law, determines a number of offenses regarding solicitation to convert religion which are safeguarded in clauses 174A, 74B, and 368. Recently, the attempts of missionary groups, mainly Christians, to solicit conversion of religion have increased. At times, these attempts do not involve monetary promises or material gains and are therefore not illegal according to the current law. But many negative repercussions, including psychological damages, warrant the intervention of the legislation. This is particularly in light of the fact that most of the attempts to bring people to convert their religion target the weaker classes who, due to their social economic standing, are more easily open to persuasion attempts such as these. Therefore, it is proposed that alongside the prohibition of giving favors as an incentive to convert religion also prohibited will be the act of solicitation to convert religion when it is done directly to a person. It is proposed to distinguish between a situation where the person being solicited is an adult, in which case the maximum penalty proposed is one year imprisonment, and a situation where the person being solicited is a minor, um, in which case the maximum penalty proposed is two years imprisonment, and therefore it is also proposed to cancel Clause 368B of the law, which deals with solicitation of a minor to convert his religion. Also proposed is to make stricter the punishment for someone who holds a ceremony of religious conversion of a minor and make it two years imprisonment instead of six months as stated presently in the Clause 368A of the law. A similar proposed amendment of the law was placed before the 24th Knesset by M.K. Moshe Gaffney and a group of M.K.s. The proposed law is identical to P24192B and so was not rechecked by the legal department of the Knesset. 
And this was submitted by the chairman of the Knesset and the deputies and placed on the Knesset table 16th of Tevet, which was January 9th of 2023. And my friend Susan sent me this one about Hal Turner's radio show.com that said, um, this was by Hal Turner, March 20th today, bill pending in Israel would criminalize talking about Jesus in person, online, in print, and by mail, two years prison. So if these people are with the Sanhedrin and they want to be the world supreme court, where does all this lead? It leads to being persecuted and criminalized and even, you know, not only imprisonment, but maybe they're incorporating the death sentence again, which they recently said they want to do, um, for people that talk about Jesus. Christian leaders are urging Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to stop a bill pending in the Israeli Knesset parliament that would make it criminal to tell people about Jesus inside Israel, the very place where the greatest rabbi of all had his ministry. Does this make any sense, people? Just days before Good Friday, Palm Sunday, and... I don't like to say the word Easter because it's not Easter. It's Passover, Feast of First Fruits, Unleavened Bread. The bill would punish believers for sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the Messiah. The bill was introduced by two ultra-Orthodox members of Netanyahu's coalition, United Torah Judaism Party. United Torah Judaism Party members Moshe Gaffney and Yaakov Asher. The bill would make it illegal to share in personal conversations. You can't do that. Or produce um, content online or in print or by mail talking about Jesus or his gospel. Their explanation in the bill is to stop Christians in particular. So they're going to kill the two witnesses, Elijah and Moses, who have this eternal testimony and that are the trees that have the rings of wood that remember everything in history about the Lord's testimony. Former U.S. Ambassador of Israeli Religious Freedom Sam Brownback, who served during the Trump administration, warned that if this bill passes, it's a threat to free speech, human rights, and religious freedom. Okay, I'm going to skip down here. The proposed legislation would outlaw all efforts of people of the Christian faith who in any way want to discuss or try to persuade people of other faiths to consider changing their current religious beliefs. Now the thing is, we Christians talk about Jesus amongst ourselves because we want to. We love him. We love our king. And we love the Messiah of Israel. So... The punishment for doing so would be this one-year imprisonment and the minor two, two years imprisonment. But this bill would apply to people having spiritual conversations with Israelis of any religion. However, their official explanation of the bill to Israeli legislators specifically emphasized the warning to stop Christians in particular. The bill's primary objective, therefore, appears to be making it illegal for followers of Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew, to explain why they believe that Jesus is both Messiah and God, with the hope that the Israelis might consider following him. The bill does not only make a simple personal conversation about Jesus with another individual a crime. It would also make it illegal for someone who solicits a person directly, digitally, by mail, or online, in order to share the gospel message, basically. Jesus said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Moreover, the book of Matthew says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. That's Matthew 5, 11, verse 12. And when it speaks about mystery, Babylon the Great, it says she killed the prophets 
That's the Scarlet Harlot. That's Jerusalem and her people. And what was said to the Pharisees in the temple that had this same attitude about Jesus? You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. And when they put the king upon the throne and he puts these dictates in place and the people have no say and they cannot be heard or vote on these issues, these are implemented and the king's mark, his royal cipher, will be put on the people to make them subservient to the king. And it's going to cause all kinds of trouble for the Jewish people. And that is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's so clear what's happening. A couple of comments down below said, Still that it is their country. If they want to ban speech about Christ, it is what it is, a country of antichrists. They have been a constant state of rebellion since God formed them into a nation in Egypt. Forty years of God's chastening in the desert, chastened in Babylon and Persia captivity, killed Christ and all the prophets, and God dispersed them to wander the world without a country, thrown out of most European countries for bad behavior, embrace Antichrist communism, and cause Russian revolution, install communism in Hungary and Bavaria, Flee Germany to America after stabbing Germany in the back by bringing the U.S. into World War I. Take over America by setting up the Federal Reserve, infiltrating Wall Street, MSM, and Hollywood. Nearly crash America with $200 billion using Ben Bernanke's helicopter money, and in the coming tribulation, two-thirds will die in a second holocaust in Zechariah 13, 8, and 9. Luther, Calvin, Ford, Lindbergh got it. When will we ever learn? When will we ever learn? God made it very clear when he told the Jews, Mankind, obey my moral laws and you will be blessed in the city, blessed in the fields, blessed going in, blessed going out, the head and not the tail, the lender, not the borrower, above and not beneath, your families will prosper and much more. Disobey my moral law and you will be cursed in the cities, cursed in the field. Read Leviticus, read Deuteronomy. But almighty dollar-loving America, let these antichrists take over our beloved country and destroy our Christian character. Is that hard to connect the dots? Come on, man. And what I think is really bad is that it's going to be the Israeli people that suffer under this. And so, antichrist is rising right there in Jerusalem. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Just as I told you, I just cannot believe that God showed me that and all of this is happening now.